What our, my team came out with a pretty high level of certainty is that it would be about $1.3 billion of, of market value. It would cost Xavier $1.3 billion to get that level of exposure. So if I think about it, why do I invest in this basketball program? Because where else in this university or really anywhere, do you have the ability every single year to potentially earn $1.3 billion of marketing exposure? This is the Sean Miller Podcast, presented by Deer Park Roofing. Now, here's your hosts, Paul Fritchner and Adam Baum, with the head coach of the Xavier Musketeers, Sean Miller. Welcome into another episode of the Sean Miller Podcast, presented by Deer Park Roofing and the official payroll sponsor of the Sean Miller Podcast, Payroll Partners. I'm Paul Fritchner, alongside Adam Baum and the head coach of the Xavier Musketeers, Sean Miller. And we're going to do a little bit of a different episode today. We're going to bring a couple of faces that are usually behind the camera in front of the camera today. And the first to my left here is really the brainchild behind all of this. This is Anthony Brain. He is the founder and CEO of Synergistic, which is a full service multimedia marketing agency here in Cincinnati. But he's also the founder of the 1831 Media Network, with this, which this Sean Miller podcast is obviously a part of. Anthony it is great to have you here on the show and, and to get you now here in front of the camera to really talk about all of this. It's been over a year. We're now on episode 52. The season starts tonight as you all listen to this. It's great to be here, really have basketball back, but especially too to be able to get you here to talk about this show and, and all the success that it's had, but also particularly the All In docuseries. That's something that we're really going to focus on here, kind of why this show is happening this year all the special things that are going into it. And then in a few minutes, we're going to bring Josh Semsrott, the video editor who has uh, put that whole show together and everything. He'll be on here to talk more about how it's all kind of gone down. But Anthony, I want to start with you and really get your thoughts on on where we are here. There's a lot that you have that you want to cover. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you here. Yeah, one, it's great to be on here. Um, hey, what's I've, up, watched, boss? <laughs> I've watched all of these episodes. I've been behind the scenes a lot. Uh, being on episode 52 is great because my favorite Xavier player of all time is Two Holloway. Yeah, nice. So, there we go. yep, I get to share that. Uh, I was excited to be here for that episode. Um, but yeah, a little bit of background on me. Paul already said it. Um, I'm kind of a, I guess what you call a serial entrepreneur. And um, most recently, you know, Synergistic, which we launched five years ago. Uh, what we do is full service media planning, marketing, buying strategy. Uh, you're addicted to basketball. I'm addicted to business growth, client growth, company growth. Uh, and so out of that, we also launched the 1831 Media Network. So excited to be on the pod today, excited to talk about these things. Uh, I also went to Xavier, met my wife at Xavier. So uh, yeah. Yeah, 2014 Xavier grad, right? Yeah, 2014 Xavier 2014. Grad. So um, let's get right into it here, talking about the docuseries, because it's something that we did the premiere on mo this past Monday night. So for some donors and people that were invited, sponsors, people that were there at the Cintas Center. It was a really special event. Sean, you were there. Coach, you know, it, it was, we had the coaches here. President Hanich was there. Sponsors were there. Um, to be able to show the, the show on the video board and, and really get the first look at it and how it's come together since we started filming this show back in the first week of June, we're going to talk more about the backstory, the idea behind it, and why it's important not just to this team and telling their story, but to the program and to the university as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. So from my perspective, why this was important, I think Xavier's, what makes Xavier special is also its largest Achilles heel, right? So when you think about it, Xavier is a smaller school. That's great. I mean, for me, it was great. Smaller class sizes, you get to know your professors, you know, you can get tickets to the basketball games. It's not super crazy. You know, you can be a big fish in a small pond. You can have that experience. But on the flip side, when you're talking about competing with Power 5 schools, when they have 4, 5, 6, 10, 20x the amount of alumni that you have, mm -hmm. number of donors you have, companies, uh, it, becomes, it can become challenging to compete, especially in the new age of athletics. And so as we thought about this docuseries, I don't think it would have happened without starting the Sean Miller podcast first. I think we recognize that Xavier fans and even just college basketball fans across the board were really excited to engage with a deeper level of content coming from you. Uh, pretty crazy to say that you now have one of the five most watched, listened to college basketball coach podcasts in America. 
Right, and it's taken Congrats, a year. Yeah. No, right, like, thanks. We did that you, you didn't say there's only six out there. But, <laughs> yeah. There's more than six, but it is yeah. it is one of the. You know, I think it I think it could be the largest, but um, you know, I think. Yeah, but anyway, regardless, um, when we think about the docu series, right? Um, you know, initially, I think it was a text from you to Adam that was, you know, hey, I love this type of content. It was Steelers. I think it was Hard Knocks. Could we do this? And the mm-hmm. thought was. Yeah, we just never in a million years thought that we'd be allowed to, right? So it ended up being a really powerful content. But back to the whole crux of, of where Xavier's can, at. Can I stop yeah. you? Yeah, absolutely. That is exactly how it happened. Now that I'm reflecting. <laughs> For sure. One of my favorite things to show our team, and I think mm-hmm. a powerful like teaching tool is behind the scenes when Mike Tomlin is addressing basically his brand new football team and I'd say in and around midsummer, late summer, when they're all coming together for training camp. And he starts, he, he talked about, you know, the standard and what that means. And then the second thing he did is, you know, he, he talked about what he calls reasonable expectations. And if you ever, uh, you know, it, it's not whether you're a Steelers fan or a Bengals fan. Mm-hmm. It, this is more about, you know, whether it's a company, you're a teacher, a parent, or you just looking at sports it's amazing to listen to the things that he hits on and the way he speaks and just how he maps it out in such like a, a succinct way, you know, where you, you, he didn't need a lot of words to say very powerful things like this is what determines who we are. And uh, so with that, you know, it's, it's funny you, you said it because I remember talking just in conversation with Adam about it. Uh, not to say, hey, we need to do one of these, and you're right. I didn't even realize that until you brought it up, that that, is, <laughs> that was kind of like the seed that allowed everything to grow for sure uh, with it. But it, it's not necessarily just the behind the scenes, but it's bringing to life, I think, the process of high-level sports on an everyday, weekly basis, not just during the season, but in the off-season, pre-season, and, and moving through it. I think it's... Uh, it's amazing that I think the different things that people will be able to see. For sure. I think any time that you can, you know, as fans, you invest your time, your energy, your resources. If you're a donor, your resources, again, same thing across the board. Now they get to see exactly what they're, what they're putting that time and energy into, right? Mm-hmm. They get to see, you know, your leadership, your capability. I think, you know, Monday night we had this awesome premiere. Uh, it was great. We had a couple hundred people come out. And a lot of people at the end of that were asking, you know, or before that were asking, you know, hey, why are you spending so much time and energy myself on whether it was launching the 1831 Media Network, Musketeer Gear at the beginning, now, you know, the Sean Miller Podcast in 1831. And, and ultimately the answer is, is that I don't know that there's a single thing, there's not a single asset that this university has, and this is a bold statement, that has the potential to grow the university faster in a guaranteed way, right? And so if I look at, you know, why my wife and I decide to give to Xavier and why I decided to give so much time, you know, to put this together, it's ultimately because there's awesome statistical data that shows that if you can reach a final four, if you can reach perpetual consistent elite eights, it literally can transform the entire university, not just the basketball program, not just athletics, the entire university. You know, it's really interesting as a fan of the sport, you know, I look at a school like Villanova, similar mm-hmm. size school to Xavier. I would say they have a similar crux in that what makes them great is how small they are. What, what makes a challenge for them to compete is, you know, how small they are, right? What's really interesting is when you look at the, the time frame from 2012, 2013, they didn't make the tournament in 2012. They did in 2013, 14. Then they wanted a 10 year run where they never missed a tournament. They made three final fours, one sweet 16, two national championships. Their endowment increased from 660 million to 1.2 billion. Right? A- am I in charge of making that happen? <laughs> right? I just want to make sure we're from an expectation perspective. <laughs> is that is that the bar around I, this place? Because because uh, that 1.2 billion it, it frightens me just a little bit. I, I what do want to. I, I do what I can say, say is that that's where I'd like to set the bar. Yeah, absolutely. Understood. Right. Um, but no, I think your job as you know it's to win games, right, and make it very clear. I'm not Sean's boss. You know, I can't dictate what he does, but. You know, for me, my philosophy on how I'm going to invest time and energy is I want to invest it in the most efficient and effective place that I can. Mm -hmm. And so if I think about this, right, 
you know, going back to Villanova, and I'm sure listeners are gonna be like, oh, enough about Villanova, but it's an incredible case study. Mm, it is. Right, and mm. so, you know, they increased, you know, back in 2010, they had 15,000 applicants, right? Now they get 23,000 applicants, mm -hmm. right? It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting is, you know, in my world, what companies pay us to do is ultimately sell more of their products, right? Through media marketing strategy, you name it. Our goal, what they hold me accountable for is their company's growth. So what's really interesting is, you know, in my world, it's all about, you know, reach. Are you reaching the right people? Frequency, how often are you reaching them? Mm -hmm. Right. And then timing is everything you want to have maximize your reach and frequency and the time that people are making purchasing decisions. Right. Mm -hmm. Not rocket science. The NCAA tournament is literally, in my opinion, like the, the most unspoken lottery in in all of America. Mm -hmm. Right. The chances to win, you know, a lottery of a billion dollars in the mega millions is like one in three hundred and two million. Right, the chances of making a Final Four, just statistically, out of roughly 360-ish Division One teams, is we'll just say one in a hundred. If you make the tournament, it's what one in 17 or one in 14. Mm -hmm. Right, if you are in a power conference, you know data would show that it's like if, once you're in the tournament, it's like one in eight, one in nine. Right, so if you think about it, how often do you have the chance to be part of that lottery? So to explain what that lottery is, I actually wanted to know myself, like how valuable is it to make a, a Final Four. What's crazy is Butler found it to be so valuable that they wrote a book about it. Mm -hmm. And so I've read that book, that was fascinating. And so then I asked my team at Synergistic, because that data is 14 years old, mm -hmm. you know, 2011, 12, 10, 11, whatever it is. I asked them, what, how, how much would Xavier have to pay to buy the exposure if you reached a Final Four? Mm -hmm. And based off of all of our data, not just the over the air time, not just the streaming, I'm talking about being featured on SportsCenter, being featured on every sports adjacent right, uh, media outlet you can think of, being in everyone's bracket, continuing to be everyone's bracket. What our, my team came out with a pretty high level of certainty is that it would be about $1.3 billion of, mm -hmm. of market value. It would cost Xavier $1.3 billion to get mm -hmm. that level of exposure. So if I think about it, why do I invest in this basketball program? Because where else in this university or really anywhere, do you have the ability every single year to potentially earn $1.3 billion of marketing exposure? Mm. Think about what that does. So then if we go back to Villanova, you know, how did they increase their endowment from 600 million to 1.2 billion? How did they increase their enrollment? How mm -hmm. did they decrease their acceptance rate from 54% to 24%? Mm. That means they're twice as competitive of a school to get into. Mm. It's very simple, and the, and the math supports it. Mm. They won the billion-dollar lottery three times. Mm -hmm. And then they won, if you win it, I mean, you approach $2 billion. They did that right. twice, mm -hmm. right? And so if we think about it, from my perspective, it's a no-brainer, mm. right? So, like, again, I'm going to use, you know, my numbers here, not yours, but, you know, if you look – and I've done a lot of research. I have a lot of friends that are on that lead NIL for some big schools. You know, the number for college basketball is anywhere. I've heard from 3 million to 6 million. I mean, maybe up to $7 million from NIL perspective, right? Those are my numbers. Per year. Per year, correct. I think to myself, everyone would say, man, that's a lot of money to pay student athletes. It has nothing to do with paying student athletes. Mm -hmm. It's getting access to a $1.3 billion lottery. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, and, and yeah, no, I mean, your points are uh, really undisputable because you, when you're speaking, you're speaking from statistical data and Correct. examples yep. that have already happened. But, you know, my reason and excitement for wanting to do the all in documentary, and there's a number of different layers to it, but I'll just start with this layer. And it goes back to when I first came here in early 2000. And, looking at the remarkable history at that moment. So we haven't even entered 2000 to 2025 space yet. Mm -hmm. We're talking about everything pre-2000. I was mesmerized as a young assistant coach of the consistency that Xavier had won, regardless of the level they were at under multiple coaches. You know, at that point, it had encompassed two decades right? A 20 year window of time. And the players, the teams, 
the coaches, and I'll start at Bob Stack to Pete Gillen to Skip Prosser, and just looking at those three before Thad came, and that's when I came to Xavier. But yet, I always felt like it was underappreciated. And when you have boots on the ground and you're a part of a coaching staff, and at that point we were just new to the Atlantic 10, fairly new. Skip Prosser did an amazing job transitioning Xavier, right, from downtown, that arena, to now the brand new CentOS, and now going from the Atlantic 10 and now becoming one of the relevant and then eventually the best program in the Atlantic 10, one of the best programs in the Atlantic 10. So when, when you boots on the ground and you're recruiting and you're coaching every day and you're traveling and you're going all throughout this country, you know, the question sometimes would pop up, where is Xavier? <laughs> and back then it was, there's an Xavier in New Orleans. It's not or in Louisiana. <laughs> yeah, or <laughs> what part of Ohio? Is it Cleveland? You know, and, and clearly there's still some of that going on, but, sure. but that changed dramatically to a large extent probably because of the visibility that the tournament presented itself to our university, et cetera, sure. right? But when I then got here and, you know, Father Hoff was here, uh, Mike Babinski would have been the athletic director. Again, we are in this new arena and we're in the Atlantic 10. I would constantly hear from people like Sister Fleming to Father Hoff to Mike Babinski to all of us as coaches. We, we want to be the front porch to something great, this university, a private Jesuit school in Cincinnati, Ohio, where you can get a world-class education and people really love you and care about you when you're a student here. And this is a way for us to bring visibility to the program. That concept that you're talking about right now on why in the year 2025, you see this docu-series or a podcast and you're referring to this name, image, and likeness and you're giving the rationale behind why you're investing or why all of us should invest in that to build our program. It's really no different, Anthony, than the initial vision that came here a long, long time ago that sure. accompanied the rise into the Big East Conference and the rise of this program over. Now, we're in five decades. We're in the middle of, of the fifth decade of sustained excellence in a lot of ways, success, some years more than others, but there's no denying what we became from early 1980s to 2025. It, it took a vision, no it question. took a belief, it took forward thinking. And I think that in some ways, what we're talking about uh, is more of the same. And that is continuing to invest in not what it once was, but what it's becoming and what we think what we can, can be. be. Keep, yeah. keep striving to be better. And, uh, and, and look, I've already said it, uh, you know, we're all hungry to get to the pinnacle and be in a final four. Um, one of the things that about the docuseries that I want to always make sure that I represent is, look, you could talk March Madness and we can all talk final fours, but like everything in life, there is a real process that has to be done correctly over long periods of time by a lot of different people to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And the focus, even though the end result is that, the focus is more on the title of this docu-series, All In, no and that is the continued building of the culture and how we go about our business on an every single day business, uh, basis so that the results will take care of themselves. Those results being a year in, year out program that can get into that tournament in advance and have that special run. Uh, I've been a part of three of those here. First one, J.J. Redick, who now is the Lakers head coach, did us in with a couple deep threes in Atlanta in a game where we were this close to being in the Final Four. And then the second time when I became the head coach, we lost to, uh, if you think about it, a Kevin Love and Russell Westbrook-led UCLA team in Phoenix. The game was over about five dribbles in. <laughs> That's what I call but, a buzzsaw, right? <laughs> that's when you said, man, I don't know if we have enough in this particular 40 minutes. Uh, but we were in that regional final, and if you won that game, you would play Derrick Rose in Memphis, right? And then the third one, I was on the other end of it where we were in San Jose at Arizona. I'm a two-seed. Coach Mack did an amazing job coaching that team with JP and, and Trayvon. I was there. I was at and, the game. Uh, Xavier won and then went on to play Gonzaga in the Elite Eight. Was that that game as well? And it would have been, right, Xavier first Final Four or Gonzaga first Final Four. Who's yep. going to do it? So uh, I had a part in all three of them. And, and look, uh, 
super excited to, to lead the charge to, to one day return there. No question. I think when you think about one thing that you've said that I agree with is that, you know, Xavier doesn't always get the respect that, that it deserves. And I think that also can come back down to math and statistics, right? Like if you make it to an elite eight, that market value is between three and 500 million, right? So think about the difference, three and 500 million versus 1.3 billion, right? If you think about the number of eyeballs that you reach when you get to a final four, that is your difference in recognition, mm -hmm. right? And so it all can come, like you can, you can yeah. root all of this in data, which is really, yeah. but back to the first question of that people have asked me, like, why am I doing it? Because I know for a fact that where I would love to see this university go is in direct alignment just with a different lens mm -hmm. that you see it. Like I truly, I mean, I've gotten the chance now. I mean, I, I wrote it on LinkedIn when we had our premiere, like you and your staff could give a masterclass on leadership and coaching. Mm -hmm. And I've been lucky enough to be around some incredible leaders in the business community. And like what I see on that, on that floor every single time that I come here that these guys get to see every day, I mean, I feel like I should have to pay more because I get to see that leadership. I never before, you know, in my time at Xavier where I've been in a position to do these things, have I ever been more confident in the team and the staff that we have? Like I view it as, you know, if these, if a docu-series, if a podcast, if that can just give us that small edge, right, to, to push us over, you know, from a standpoint of recruiting. I talked about it on Monday night in the transfer portal, right? These, these you know, men have 30 days to make a decision, right? They may have never met you before. Mm -hmm. They have met, never even thought of playing for you before. They have never even been to Cincinnati before, mm -hmm. right? How are they making a decision on what's it like? What's he coach? What is he coaching like? What's it like? What's the vibe? What's the feeling? What's, what's their program all about? Now, if they want to, and they're having these questions, they can pull up YouTube and literally see in the locker room, they can see behind mm -hmm. the scenes, they can see you coach and they can see you in the huddle where not every program is going to have that benefit, mm -hmm. right? So from a recruiting perspective, I think it can help. You talk about market and media value, you know, I'm super proud to say that we signed this awesome deal with Local 19 here in, in the city. Every single Tuesday night after the news is now Xavier night in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. If you think about that, that's 52 weeks out of the year that now Xavier will be at the forefront of a major television station here in Cincinnati that they didn't have before. Mm -hmm. And so if Xavier were to buy all of that market value, you're talking, you know, north of $3 million, mm -hmm. right? Like that they don't have to pay for that, right? And, they get access yeah. to that. And, and the other side of it too, Anthony, that whether it's the podcast or this docu-series is the reason that I'm, I'm excited about it is the other reasons that I'm excited about, about this is we're allowed to tell the stories of our own players and, and, they deserve to be able to tell their story, their path, because in every recruiting dynamic situation, it's different. There's not two that are the same. You know, over the years, you, one sit recruiting scenario may remind you of others, but you think about it, every family's unique to themselves. And, you know, every situation is a little bit different from, from the next one. So the path that they grew up, under and the path that they're on, all of those are a little bit unique as well. And I, I think that's what I enjoy about interviewing, you know, a guy like Two Holloway, because, you know, when we recruited Two, I remember what he looked like, what he what he acted like, where he would have been in life as an 18 year old student from high school. And to see the growth, you know, more than a decade later and what he's become and having a college degree from Xavier. You know, those are the stories that want to make you coach. Those are the stories mm -hmm. that I think really allow you to feel good about what we're doing. Um, and these these moments, whether it be on the podcast and then certainly uh, I think this season, we're going to be able to tell a lot of different stories. And I look at Zach Fremantle and Jerome Hunter. Just think about their path. It's remarkable. And, and we don't have the last chapters at Xavier finished yet. But I'm anxious to, to be a part of it and see them get there to the end because when you talk about overcoming adversity, uh, dealing with obstacles head on, uh, dealing with dark times and loneliness and overcoming it, you know, really gravitating towards becoming a part of something that is just bigger than yourself and learning the power of that. I mean, those two guys, their stories are better than any story that you could say, look where he's at today. 
because of, of what they've overcome. And this opportunity of doing uh, the All In documentary, it gives us a chance to really allow them to shine and to tell their story. No question. I've been lucky enough to get to know them uh, over the years. And uh, yeah, I mean, like you couldn't, you couldn't want success for two guys more than those two guys, right? I mean, especially what Jerome and, and both Zach has gone, have gone through. I mean, I've gotten to the point now where I know Zach's parents pretty well, right? Yeah. And it's like, I want it so bad for them too, right? And then, you know, Jerome is one of the nicest humans I've ever met, mm. you know, and talk about someone that doesn't deserve what happened to him. You know, it's, if yeah. anyone deserves to make a deep run in the tournament, it's Jerome Hunter. And so I'm excited. I feel really excited that we're doing this this year. Mm. Um, I'm, ex you know, and my, I'm hopeful that we create content like this year after year, if it makes sense, right? But yeah, I think Xavier fans in this world of the portal, in the world of NIL, you, you're going to have a new, partially new team every year, more than just high school students coming here, right? Like you're going to, you're going to have to get to know, you know, players that may not have even played in the same time zone that you were in, right? And so this gives them the ability to meet to fans, to meet them, to experience them, to engage with them and create this fandom with them that I think otherwise, you know, wouldn't necessarily happen. Yeah. One of the things about college sports that just makes college sports so great and intriguing is the pageantry of it. It's players that stick with your program. You, you see them, like you said, with two Holloway, you recruit them, they come in as freshmen, they leave as seniors. And Fans fall in love with them. Yeah, like, <laughs> like, like senior, senior night happens, they get a standing ovation, you grow with the program, you become attached to them. You think back to some of the, the, the recent examples of that with J.P. Makura, Trayvon Blewett, Sean O'Mara, that recruiting class that, that really changed the course of this program at that point, got the school's first number one overall, or number one seed in the tournament. And now here in the age of the portal, I think one of the things that, you know, Adam and I, Sean, that we've really tried to do this year, and especially in the off season, is highlight these guys that have entered the program through the podcast that fans don't get to know as well if you don't have the podcast, if right. you don't hear those interviews. And I think that's one of the most frequent comments that we get is mm -hmm. this off season has been so great to hear these stories, like hearing Lucina's story. And it's unfortunate he's not going to be able to play this year with the team, but hopefully he comes back next year, everything's okay. And you get to learn and understand that, hey, he had to go through a lot just to get to this point, just to yeah. learn English, just yeah. to get over here to America, just to play basketball at this level. You want him to succeed. Dante Maddox, Ryan Conwell, mm. Marcus Foster, transferring up to these levels. It's not just that you see them play on November 4th through March and they just, oh, that's it's another guy out there. You get mm. to know their story. You get to know those things. And now you add in this layer of, Oh, now you get to see them off the court too. Mm -hmm. Now you go and you get to see, you know, Davion McKnight, who just got engaged a few weeks ago. You know, you you get to learn those stories, and it's more illuminating to a fan base. You become more attached. You become more, you know, engaged in the program too. Simply because no matter what program you're referring to, you won't have as many coming in as freshmen and graduating as seniors. Exactly. Then then you're not going to have nearly as many as you, as you once did. That, that's yeah. just, that's not a Xavier situation or a Big East Conference situation. That's just the new landscape of college basketball. Yeah. So there is more change from one season to the next. And I think the storylines and the familiarity, if you love Xavier basketball, how do you get what you once had? Well, we're, we're trying to fill in, really, for lost time. You're not going to see Davion play here for four years. But in the two years that he's here, we're going to try to allow you to get to know him. And he's going to have the opportunity to tell his story, you know, through through what we're yep. creating here. And, and that, again, I get asked, like, wait, you're doing a podcast or you're doing this docuseries? Are you the same guy? Are you OK? <laughs> what, what is the catch here? What am I missing? And there's really no catch other than. You know, people talk in industry and in life that you have to adapt, evolve, and change. That it's the one thing that's guaranteed. The world continues to to bring new challenges, and it's different than it once was. You have to be on the on that edge of um, how do I continue to grow and be the best that we can be in this new model. And I think that a lot of the things that you guys have brought to the table, it allows us to to think like we're thinking. Uh, and I, I believe it's the right way. Recruiting, dealing with your players, building our program. And as important is making sure that if you're a Xavier fan, alum, somebody that loves this university, 
that you're able to follow our basketball program in a first class manner. Yeah, I couldn't couldn't agree more. And last thing I want to touch upon too, just to again, I'm a nerd when it comes to growth, right? And it comes to these numbers. What's really interesting is I talked about, you know, reach and frequency at the beginning of this episode, right? Are you reaching the right people and how frequently? I believe that this this programming is reaching the right people and it's reaching mm. that frequency. And the next part is timing. So if you look at the success of any university, it really is underlined by getting new students to come to the university and retaining them, mm -hmm. right? So if you were to literally cherry pick the perfect time of year mm -hmm. that you would want high school students to be you know, seeing your program, it would be in the month of March and early April. Why? Because they have to make their college decision by May 1st. Students apply in the fall, right? High school mm -hmm. students apply in the fall, and then from there, they're going to get acceptance letters anywhere from February to, to March or for your early decision, maybe a little bit before then. And then they have to decide by, by May 1st. Mm -hmm. What happens right in the smack dab middle of all of that is the NCAA tournament. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, you know, when clients come to us, you know, you know, they're saying, you know, when is the right time for us to outlay our resources to get the most growth potential? Where is that efficient window of time, mm -hmm. right? If you are a university, that efficient window of time is literally the month of March. Mm -hmm. And that ultimately is why you see schools, universities separate themselves when they have athletic success, specifically college basketball success in March. And the last thing I'm, I'm going to leave with is the um, basically there's a, a board, there's an educational statistics, uh, statistics board that follows all universities. From the years of 2010, to this year, 2023, the average university has decreased in enrollment by 15%. Wow. The average university, right? I just want to give Xavier a lot of credit because in that same time, we've increased our enrollment by 10%. Mm -hmm. So 25% more than the national average. Yeah. But if you were to compare that to a Villanova or other schools, it is perpetually more, mm -hmm. right? And ultimately, I think that you know, I think Xavier is putting them in positions, themselves in positions to, uh, to succeed. I have to give credit to President Hanich and his staff to, for, you know, bringing a medical school to the university. Mm -hmm. I also look at Xavier. Xavier launched seven new academic majors this mm -hmm. past year, right? That doesn't, you don't see every university mm -hmm. investing in those new majors, all of which are pretty modern around AI technology, you name it. Mm -hmm. They're moving forward. And I think like, I think Xavier, almost more than any other school, could benefit more than anyone Mm -hmm. from winning this March lottery. Mm -hmm. And so from my perspective, what I'm good at, I don't know anything about half the plays you run down on that court. <laughs> I've never played competitive basketball in my life, but I know that my abilities are in content creation and marketing and strategy and development and growth. And I'm going to throw everything I've got at that to try to help us get over that hump. And that's why, that's why I'm so passionate about what we're doing. And the last thing I'll say is I know some people will say, you know, hey, does this take away from your time and energy coaching? I've made it abundantly clear to the gentlemen that are working and women that are working in 1831 that if we ever become a distraction, if we ever inhibit the success of this team on the floor, it's no longer worth it, yeah. right? Because ultimately, Which, yeah, and, and I'll, inter I'll interrupt you on that, and that that is not the case, you know, because look, my primary job is to be the best version of myself I can be to lead our basketball team and program, and in particular, coach the team. And in, in this doesn't do anything other than amplify that because uh, you guys, you know, just I, I my day is about the same. But I will also tell you that doing the podcast and doing the docu series, if there's anything asked of me additionally, I put it in the category that we've talked a lot about on this podcast. And that in my mind, in 2025, to be a leader of a college basketball program, this this is time you well spent. It. Yep. It's time well spent because of everything you've already, you know, eloquently mapped out. And, uh, and, and I go back to because it's dollars and cents and it's enrollment and there's a lot of other things. But the human side of Xavier is, I, I think, it's what captivates people that love this place. You know, if you were a student here, you look back on your experience and you know that you were a real important person as a student here. You were treated as such. And I think that being able to treat our players where they can tell their story and they have the best support around their mission, 
you know, that's what this is all about. And, and I do believe that being on the podcast and, and being a part of, of, of what we're doing now uh, allows them even a bigger platform to do that, to be you know, supported. You know what I'm most excited about, Sean, for this whole docu-series thing is, you know, you, we get to see you every day. We get to be around yeah. every single day. Be careful day. what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's yeah. the coolest thing is like, you know, Paul played sports yeah. growing up. Josh played sports. Anthony played sports. To me, the most fun I've ever had in my entire life is being a part of a team. And I'm well aware that we are not on the roster. We're not coaches. <laughs> but like just being around the team every day, there's something really like invigorating about mm -hmm. that that's fun to be a part of. And we get to document it. So, yeah. I mean, from my perspective, and again, I've never played competitive basketball. Something feels different about this team from mm -hmm. my perspective. It just the vibe, the feel, the culture, the camaraderie. So I'm excited about the season. Uh, but I'd be remiss if I didn't say a few other a few other things. I'm not on the mic very often, but um, ultimately I look at you know the other programs across the country that are creating content like this. You know, Alabama, Notre Dame, Ohio State, and a little in a, in a little fraction of that. Like those are programs we want to be surrounded by. Like if mm -hmm. we're those are the programs that are mm -hmm. up in the upper echelon of all the data that I've talked about, right? So we ultimately, I want to make sure that as a university, we can stay there and do everything yep. I can to do it. But lastly, I think when you look at the difference between a tournament team and a Final Four team, like from a mathematical perspective, it comes down to coaching, program, process, and resources, right? In a block charge call. And a, yeah, a block <laughs> charge call. Or, or, or a fadeaway three that yeah. goes in, right? <laughs> For sure. There's, 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 there's that. Again, I'm trying to figure out what can, I, what can I do to help put this forward. And so, like, again, on Monday night, I said I don't want to sell timeshares, but I might sell a few timeshares on this, on this episode in the sense of if you're a fan, like, we have, you know, just 7,900 tickets here that are season ticket holder held. Mm -hmm. Right, so ten thousand two fifty, I think just under eight thousand of those are held by season ticket holders, and maybe more this year. Uh, that means we have just over, just under three thousand season ticket holders. Right, mm -hmm. if you just took our seats, right, that are held by season ticket holders, mm -hmm. right, and you took my number here, a six million dollar number, divide it. So let's say for NIL for resources for the university, you divide that by the seven thousand seats in here, divide that by the eighteen games. I think the I think I have it on my phone here. The dollar amount is is less than a subscription to you know for cable, right? It would come out to thirty five dollars a game. So if you want to give Sean Miller the resources that he needs to go do this, it's thirty five dollars extra a game per seat held by season ticket holders. Sold. And so I'm to it. I'm, I'm, <laughs> one thing this podcast reminds me or just makes me aware of is I would have hated to be your trigonometry teacher. <laughs> <laughs> or your geometry teacher. I mean, did Listen, you teach I'm Xavier the class? educated. Did I'm you teach the class? I'm I mean, Xavier educated. Did they have to teach you anything or did you just figure Listen, it out on your own? They, My they, God. They taught, me, they taught me a lot here. I, what I, can, I, would be, I would be nowhere near where I am today if it wasn't for this university. There's no question about it. No, you love it. it. And, and Anthony, no thank you for everything that you've done. You've, you've not gone an extra step. You really have gone an extra mile to support our basketball program, and you continue to say it, and I know it, the passion inside of you, it's far greater than that. It's, it's more about this place, this university. And, and I think that all of us that are affiliated with Xavier basketball truly understand that we're a part of something bigger than that as well, which is this great university. And I think that what we do, and you know, I always ask, if, if we do this, is this good for our university? Like, does this benefit our university? And uh, I think we feel that There's what no we're question. doing doing does that. And we feel that passion. So thank you from it's all not of our us opinions. for what you like, do. Yep. Again, I could talk for four more hours about data, about all this stuff. I won't. I'll spare all of you. But again, like, whether it's final 2%, whether it's being a sponsor on this, like, we're still looking for sponsors for this podcast. Yeah. I shouldn't say we're looking. Of course we're looking, but we have availability on this podcast. If you want to sponsor the docu-series, it's going to reach probably a million households within Cincinnati and the mm -hmm. extending region. So regardless of Xavier fans or your target audience, if, if Cincinnati is your target audience, you're going to reach that through this docu-series. And what I would say is reach out to Seth, reach out to Final 2%. I mean, and if, and if you're not in a position to give, trust me, I've been there before too. Just support the X more often than you do. 
the more that that logo is out there, the better off we are as well. So I'll stop telling, telling timeshares. I believe Josh is going to come up. I want to give a big thank you to Josh because the content that you're going to see in this uh, docu-series would literally not be possible without Josh. I know you guys get to see Adam and Paul all the time, but this guy is truly the unsung hero of this docu-series. And uh, I'm happy to, to step out from the, from the uh, camera and definitely get behind the camera. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Yep. We'll take a quick break here. Josh will swap spots, and then we're going to finish up with a quick segment just uh, since today is the first game of the season, previewing the season, wrapping up the the uh, preseason. So thanks, Anthony. Yep. Thank you. The Sean Miller Podcast is proud to partner with Deer Park Roofing, a company that's provided elite service for homes and businesses since 1996 and leads the industry in professionalism, quality, and responsiveness. Whether your needs are residential or commercial, like the outstanding work on the Cintas Center, the home of Xavier Basketball, Deer Park can handle any job and ensure it's done right. Deer Park's motto is protect what's important, and what's important to you is important to Deer Park Roofing. Visit DeerParkRoofing.com. The Sean Miller Podcast is proud to partner with Payroll Partners, where you're not just a number. That means providing a best-in-class HR and payroll experience that was built on award-winning technology and live support customer service with a dedicated payroll specialist who's just a phone call away. You shouldn't have to choose between technology and customer service. At Payroll Partners, you get both. Payroll Partners is locally owned and operated by a proud Xavier alum. Visit payrollpartners.net. That's payrollpartners.net. Welcome back to the Sean Miller Podcast. We appreciate each and every one of you listening, subscribing, sharing, all of that good stuff. To my left, it is Josh Semsrott. If you go back a ways, I forget which episode number it was, but Adam and I did a show, just the two of us when, Sean, you couldn't be here for a show. Um, it was just the two of us for one. We took some fan questions, answered that. Josh, you came on for a few minutes, but we wanted to sit you down, give you a proper introduction here to the Sean Miller Podcast. We appreciate you. You're, you are a, a Cincinnati guy, grew up here on the, uh, well, north of here, but now you're a west side guy. You and, you yeah. and Adam, west Hell side guys. Yeah. Um, but to give people listening to this and watching this an introduction as to your role here, you have been the one behind the camera. You are the producer of this show. You're the one that now has taken over editing the All In docuseries. And where this kind of stems from is the fact that if you watch Hard Knocks or if you watch any of these big, you know, premier HBO shows, you, you get to the end and it's a three minute credit scene with 50 or 60 names on that list just for the audio. <laughs> and now you get to a crew of the three of us doing a show of this magnitude and to people that saw episode one, I mean, it was, it was a lot of people that reached out and said, please pass on to you how much we enjoyed it and how well we thought it was produced. And, and, uh, you know, I think that is kudos to you for being able to wrap up three months worth of footage. I don't know how many hours, but countless hours of footage that you had to comb through over now four months of time to then condense that into 44 minutes of content. Um, welcome to the show and uh, kind of walk us through what a monumental task that was. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be here uh, other than kind of that weird yeah. when I came on before and just stood behind you guys. Great to actually sit down. And <laughs> yeah, we got you a chair this yeah. time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and it's actually I'm glad we're doing this today because this is uh, the one year to the day that I was sitting at home, no trick or treaters, and I got a call from one Paul Fritchner. Oh, that's right. Telling it was me Halloween. about this podcast that they needed a video guy for and 1831 Media Network. And here we are. Now you're yeah. editing the podcast. I, yeah. We've got a docuseries. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, that's right. So, over the last two and a half months, if you've noticed any glitches or anything in the show, it's because when we decided in about uh, middle of August, I would say, Josh and I sat down and I realized how much he was working on both the docuseries and the show, this actual podcast by that point, I said, dude, let me just edit the show uh, every week. So I've taken over in the last probably 10 or 11 episodes of... And you've done a fine job. It's and I good. We've got no comments on, on the difference, and that's because of your teaching job. So I appreciate that. But uh, just, just again, walk us through kind of your process for deciding what was important 
to go on the show, the storylines that you felt like you wanted to establish here in episode one, and what fans can expect to see out of a show like this for Xavier? Well, the storylines are a lot, like obviously we've talked a lot about what the all-in mantra is, and the storylines, I kind of think of them as a, what is the, the in? And Sean, you've talked about yeah, that no, on the a podcast a couple it. times, mm -hmm. and yep. in these team meetings, you'll see it in the show on what is the in, and you guys were kind of talking before about like, you know, March Madness is obviously the end game, but you know, what are these guys doing in June to get to that spot? And it's kind of hard because with this team, there's so much talent on the team and there's so much that has happened that these guys have accomplished just in the summer. I mean, you look at guys like John Hughley and what he's accomplished just in the months he's been here. We were talking about this statistic that you'll see in, uh, episode two about Trey Green and what he's done stripe work, mm -hmm. not just this summer, but since he's been at Xavier overall. Yeah, we he's got the official numbers. Incredible, yeah, it's incredible it's, stats. And you, yeah. there's stories that need told, but you know, there's so many stories like that that have just happened in the past couple months. So combing through all that footage, trying to figure out like, how does this fit into March? How does this fit into the team? And how does this fit into the in of All In? So. Yeah. It's definitely a, a lot of a lot of footage. Yeah, it, it's a lot of footage, and it's also a lot of scheduling, too, that I know Adam, uh, from his perspective, that takes care of all the, the times with sitting down and getting guys, and whether it's working around weight room or anything, that making sure, again, we're not a distraction, that we're working around whatever the yeah. schedules are. So, Adam, uh, how, well, how's it been from your perspective? From my perspective, I know what a challenge it is for Josh to do what he's doing, right? So... <clears throat> the way I'm approaching everything is what can I do to make Josh's life easier? If there's something that he needs to execute, I'm going to do everything I can to set that up in a timely, efficient manner so that we can check that box and get on to the next thing. So really, you know, I, I'm not sure. So Anthony is obviously our boss, right? And when I left the Enquirer, Anthony hired me as a copywriter at Synergistic. In the back of his head, he had all this sort of ruminating this grand vision and scheme and great boss. Um, I love my time at synergistic. I will forever be, um, ride or die with my synergistic homies, but I'm no longer going to work at synergistic. I'm going to do this full time now. So when I say you're going to see even more of me, you're going to see even more. Means. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. But yeah, it's like, it's, it's really a team, a team effort, you know? And I think to echo what Sean said earlier, right? We're not asking Sean to do anything. We, are, we want you to be yourself. We want you to coach the team as you see fit. It's our job to be there and not be in the way and document it, you know? The only time we might get in the way is when we throw we clip a mic on you. <laughs> that, that might be the only time, hopefully. But, but I think to that point, there were a lot of things that we used in the voiceovers for episode one where you were kind of the, the narrator or yeah. the voice of the show, but it wasn't like if you watch Hard Knocks and, and leave Schreiber – He's reading off a script. He's given things. He's told, here's what you're going to read. Here's what you're going to do. The way we did this to make it a little less intrusive was, let's just maybe take a podcast clip. Let's take an interview clip. Let's take things that we've talked about and build it around the storylines that we already have yeah. here on the show. And I think to, to everyone's credit, right? I think episode one, our goals were we wanted to highlight Xavier, the, the rich history of this program. We wanted to develop characters. Who are some of these people that you're going to see on the basketball court this year? And then we also wanted to hit people with the ultimate goal, the end goal. Every every Division One team's goal is to make the NCAA tournament. So that's kind of episode one. But what I will say is, like, we're going to have eight, maybe nine, maybe ten episodes of this thing. If someone's not visible in episode one, you're probably going to meet them or be introduced to them in episode two. And then from there, it's kind of what happens you know, a lot of what happens on the floor, what happens in a specific game is going to dictate the direction of this show. But uh, this has been the most challenging thing I've ever done. Yeah. And it's also been the most fun thing that I've ever done. So I, I appreciate you letting us be a part of it and do it. No, yeah. it's, you know what, it's uh, you guys make it easy on us. And, um, and to echo what you said, Adam, there's nothing that, that we are going to do that we wouldn't do if we weren't on if you guys weren't were yeah. were or were not around, like in other words, you don't change the direction or course of anything we do, right? You just you just kind of go go yep. along with it, and and you're able to bring to life our way, the in, because you know Josh, you're right. In the summer, 
I probably speak for all college basketball coaches. You know, the summer is your summer program. We we all have one. We they're not all identical, but we we have one. If you don't have one, uh, you, you're probably not going to be around very long as a program coach, player, etc. Right? There has to be certain things that are accomplished. There are certain NCAA rules that need to be followed in terms of access to players and time allowed on the court versus another period of time, right? Uh, then you have your preseason, which is, you know, the beginning of the school year to, you know, really the, the first day of what we call fall practice, okay? So we call that our 10th war program. And that's because, uh, you know, we want to be in superior condition. The 10th war represents the last four minutes of a game. You know, who are you? Do you believe in yourself? Are, are you going to be able to finish this thing? Um, and that's what preseason is, right? Getting ready. Um, and then you have your fall program, which is 30 practices in 42 days. Not a lot of people realize that every one of us as college basketball programs have the identical model. We all get 30 practices before four, in 42 days before our season opener. Now, how do you go about that? Again, there's different ways of approaching it, but we have our way, the end. Uh, then we're going to get into our non-conference season which uh, there's a few conference games that, that trickle into that. That's different than it once was, too. And it used to be just non-conference. Okay, that's over with. Now we play the Big East or the Atlantic 10. Well, that's not the case. So juggling that, but that, that really is from the season opener until Christmas, right, in and around Christmas. And then, obviously, you have your conference season, a 20-game gauntlet in the Big East Conference, which is going to – end in Madison Square Garden. After the conference season, you have your postseason. Sometimes it's very short. You know, you played in Madison Square Garden, and it ended. Last year, you played in Madison Square Garden, two games, and you went to an NIT. Not what you want, but you went to a postseason. You know, two years ago, we went all the way to Saturday in the championship game of the Big East Tournament, a three seed, the Sweet 16, and it ended in Kansas City against Texas. Well, guess what? Like, it doesn't end there. That, that's postseason. Well, then it's like what you can make the case, arguably the most important part of the season for the following year. And that becomes in and around when the transfer portal ends until maybe mid to late May. Uh, you're building your roster. You're retaining players. You're putting it all together. And that's completely different. Yeah. Yeah. than it once was even four years ago. When I first came here, if you would have said May's going to be your most important month, I'd be like, you got the wrong sport. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's it. And then, then where were we at at that point? You're at a new beginning of a summer program with a brand new group. So you see, like, it, it really is, in fact, a year-long process. And you guys have the opportunity to document, you called it all in, the in, our way. What, what is it that you're committing to? And I think that's so important as a coach that your players and your staff have a way, have a standard operating procedure, regardless of what time of year, where we're all in to be the best we can be in this segment of the year. Well, and that's, and, and that's what's crazy about, you know, our friend jo John Rothstein that likes to say we sleep in May. Yeah, uh, I've... I, since last May, I've said that that is now inaccurate because there. Once you get through May, and then something that I'm really proud of that we've done is introducing these transfer guys to Xavier fans. It's something that you see now with like as the season starting, some of these other programs and message boards. Like, who are these guys? We were at in May trying to you know as soon as these guys joined the Xavier Musketeer roster, introducing these guys the best we could to the fans, and then boom, we're in it. Like yep. it's it started then. So this we sleep in new. Uh, it's sleep really in June. Yeah. I went it's on really Rothstein. Sleep? Rothstein sleeps in May. Sean and everyone else in college basketball, they just they don't sleep. They That's keep right. going. But telling those stories yeah. mm -hmm. that start in June, you know, you guys were talking about Jerome and Zach a little bit. You know, you'll see, I think something that's, you know, being talked about a lot right now is like, oh, it's so great to see these guys back. It's going to be so great to like watch them be out there, watch Jerome Hunter out on the court for the first time in so long. And with 
the utmost respect to them, you know, it's it's been a long time. They're not just going to waltz back out there and hit You're an alley oop so right. and ring the rim exactly. every time. You're exactly right. What has gone, you know, what has gone into that? You think of everything that Jerome Hunter's gone through in the past year alone. Yeah. I mean, same could be said about Zach. Same could be said about Davion McKnight. You know, those trials and tribulations are ultimately that triumph of them walking out of the tunnel. Yeah. Uh, when you're listening to this tonight, when they walk out of that tunnel, that moment is cool and we're all going to celebrate that and see it. But the impact that that moment has, like you're going to get to see all of what's gone into that, how hard they've worked, how much they've sacrificed. And we've talked a lot with them this past week about that and just, you know, hearing them talk about, you know, how dark it can get, how lonely it can get. I don't think that gets talked about enough in sports injuries. And so being able to bring that to light yeah. just makes, you know, tonight when they walk out there, out that tunnel, mm-hmm. just makes it so much more impactful. Yeah, and, you, you know, being a part of something that's bigger than yourself, that has nothing to do with sports. You know, right now you guys are a part of something that's bigger than your own family or your own career. You're part of, a, you know, a company and, you know, you're, you're so dependent on each other. But there's the greatest gift that we can give Lucina Treor to overcome a torn ACL and a season-ending injury, which is just devastating for him, is to have two teammates like Zach Fremantle and Jerome Hunter. You know, that brotherhood of, no, I've been exactly in your shoes. I know what it feels like when you have surgery, how sick you are, how you just you, you feel like, you know, so terrible in those first couple of days. And then I also know how you feel when that subsides and now the reality is I'm on crutches for the next 6, 8, 10, 12 weeks and, God, what do I have to look forward to? You know, that daunting feeling uh, that you only know if you've been there. And so who does Lucina lean on and, you know, what power of, of our group can we give him? Well, we have a lot of guys that have overcome their own obstacles and adversity, and uh, and they can empower him and help him through what will be one of the most challenging times of his life. Yeah. So to peel back the curtain a little bit on this show as we kind of wrap this up here is to tell you a little bit about how this all, again, kind of got started, I think, from our perspective, too, and also just the logistics of what you'll be able to see and what you can expect this year. So just from that perspective... The show will debut on Fox 19 at 11.30 p.m. on November 12th. There's a game that night here at Cintas, so you can go home. You can watch. You can turn on Fox 19, watch the show starting at 11.30. It'll be available the next day on YouTube. The two shows will be exactly the same. The only difference is that we did leave a little bit of the profanity in on YouTube. There's not much. There's not much, but to give it a real feel, we left it in on YouTube that's obviously bleeped. We're not getting any FCC violations. We bleeped all that out on Fox 19. That's the only difference between the the, the two shows. Um, but the first episode will cover the preseason. It'll cover everything that we started filming back in uh, the first week of June. And I remember that text that Adam sent to us to say, hey, there's a meeting. The first team meeting is, is happening on Sunday. And Sean wants us there to film it. We might turn this into something a lot bigger than you know, what this, we weren't really sure at that point what all of this now has spiraled into. And I remember Josh was on a 10 day vacation at that point. And he came back and we kind of all looked at each other and we said, yeah, I think you're, I think the role has changed a little bit. Yeah. I was, I was off the grid in Colorado and got a bunch of texts at once about this whole thing. And then just kind of like how it started with the podcast too, just kind of jumped right into it. And then all of a sudden we had uh, about a two week span in June and a two week span in July where, I mean, we were, we were pushing through terabytes of footage because we didn't really know what we were building yet. So we were, just around yeah. constantly. Our I remember philosophy some of the guys were like, man, you guys shoot are everything. filming everything. <laughs> yeah. And we weren't sure what we were building yet. So, and I think that's what kind of, I, I'd say is a good example of how the show is going to go is that this summer was so fun. There were so many like great things. Uh, you really got like a sense of the potential that this roster had. And you'll see this in episode one, just it feels triumphant and fun. And then, I was driving in here when I got your text, Adam, about Lucina. I, I nearly hit, almost had to pull over because it hadn't hit me yet about 
you know, it was so fun telling all these triumphant stories and how great this roster is going to be, how great these guys are, how professional they are, how they carry themselves every day, to then have to turn around and tell that other side of the story for yeah. La Cena. Yeah. I mean, and that's, yeah. that's college basketball. Right. So yeah. a lot of this exactly is like month right. to month going mm-hmm. to be, that's something that like I'm having to learn just the month to month of being yeah. in the college basketball season, how to best tell these stories, how they work into all in. Mm. So we'll be on the road. We'll be with the team. I would say by episode three, we'll really be caught up to where the team is at that point. Episode one and episode two will catch you up. You'll be totally on board with the season and the preseason, maybe the first game or two. But by episode three, you'll be totally uh, immersed in where we are in the current point of the season. Would you say that is yeah? Spot it it, it kind of gets off. I, I wouldn't say it's like a slow start, but we start at the very, very beginning. And like yep. I said, a lot of great things happened over the summer. So we want to be able to tell all those stories, build the storylines, yep. build the storylines, introduce you to these guys. Um, so I think you know, once we get into the season, into some bigger games, into Big East play, there's a lot of fun stuff, fun practices from. Yeah. Uh, Coach, that, yeah. yeah, we'll get we'll get to in the <laughs> Big East season. Yep. Absolutely. No, and I think it's also important to remind people like you we're we reference hard knocks a lot. Hard knocks turns around five days of filming. They they basically turn it around every week. So it's like when when a new episode comes out on Monday, that stuff just happened the week before. We have three people. It's they're gonna take a little bit more time to actually put these episodes together. So it might be a month. It might be three weeks. It might be five weeks. It's very much going to be dependent on what happens and and how well we can uh, we can help out our guy Josh here in the film. And room. I'm I'm g- sifting through footage and trying <laughs> yeah. to piece the puzzle together as much as I can. And that's probably like the greatest gift of the show is I I would other than the players and the guys on the court and maybe his wife. There's no one that listens to Sean Miller speak as much as I do. <laughs> God bless you. Um, and you know, people ask me like, Oh, don't you get tired? And I was like, would you get, would you yeah. get tired of listening? No. So it's easy to stay motivated when you're constantly like immersed. And like we were talking, Anthony mentioned, and we were talking about before in such a professional, efficient, you know, one of the things that I keep coming across when I interview guys is I'll always ask anyone I interview here, what's your favorite thing about coming to work at Xavier every day? I don't think a single person has not answered the people. Yeah. Um, and yeah. it's the people, the systems, how much people care, how much people want to help you. And that's rubbed off on these guys so much, just how they carry each other. Each, you know, They're so professional each and every day coming yeah. in here and getting their yeah. work in. And being around that, that's, that's a true gift. And Sean, mm. we thank you so much for well, letting us be a part of it. If you want to know how much Josh – listens to you every day sometimes in the office i'll just hear him yell out like pace <laughs> run the <to> score <laughs> he's really much picked up on on a lot of your mannerisms <laughs> yeah. yeah no i can see that yeah, for sure. um, and, yeah i'm not the most complex guy you know you gotta stay gotta keep it gotta keep it simple but uh, look speaking of complex versus simple one thing is i've learned in today's episode of this podcast is i have two assignments I got to get to 1.2 billion here at this <laughs> yep. university, and I got to w- win our ass off. <laughs> so, I think you, you uh, those two things. I yeah, mean, think about it. If we if, if we accomplish that, I mean, you guys are just oh, we'll the time. Yeah. you're gonna have the time of your life. Yeah, I mean, well. yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. So it's not it's not that big of a deal. No. <laughs> no. Um, last thing here to wrap up this show again as we've mentioned a million times in this episode tonight is game number one texas southern you build from the first week of june over five uh, five months i mean just every day of of everything you need to do to get to this point and now finally you're gonna play somebody that doesn't say xavier on their jersey it's not an inner squad scrimmage and it counts this one that's true dayton notre dame and the secret scrimmage but now here we are you beat Dayton. We can't really talk about the Notre Dame secret scrimmage, but everybody saw what happened at Dayton. Coach, what is your overall message, thought process, summation of the preseason as you head in to game number one of this season? Well, um, you know, I think there's probably two levels to the answers to that to the question you ask. You know, I, I think that you, you have to get to know your group and your team 
no matter how hard we work during the summer months, once the actual fall semester begins and you're around each other even more, right, which the rules allow you to be, you get into those 30 practices in 42 days, you continue to know what you're good at, what you need to get better at. And then, unfortunately, sometimes you have to deal with the hardship and the reality of that somebody like Lucina, who would have been our best shot blocker, rebounder, and a key part to what we were doing, we lost him. And now, once you come through that reality, it then becomes our charge to be the best we can be, whatever that is. Sometimes you grow in a direction that you, you can't comprehend, like, wow, in a positive. Other times, and last year would have been a reflection of that, that some of these injuries that we sustained a year ago, in essence, two starters, based on the change we went through, it was too much for us to overcome. Um, so I think looking at it, you know, I, I certainly wish we didn't have any season-ending injuries. You know, if I go through the Big East Conference – who has lost a starter already? I think we have. I don't think any, any of the other 10 teams have. It's not something that happens like a football program where because of the contact of the sport, that happens more, not less. So that's our reality, and we, we've lived with it. We're on the other side of it. I think we've done a really good job kind of reinventing ourselves to a certain degree. Um, and then I think the second part of it is we want to be the most ready we can be. And we talk a lot about March Madness. To not talk about it, I don't want to say is irresponsible, but like, look, if you're a part of college basketball, our players hear about it, think about it, dream about it every day, or else they wouldn't be playing. But that's the end result. What we're in total charge of right now, and we just have to be careful we don't ever get too far ahead of ourselves as a team, is – our process, and our process now shifts from fall practices of 30 and 42 days to our non-conference season. It's different. And yes, for the first time, we're going to be wins and losses. Some players are going to play more than others. We have to start five and not start others. There's roles that are defined. You're going to be dealing with different things now, different pressures, and we have to handle that. And I would also say this, that you can't die every time you lose. And you certainly can't get carried away like you won a national championship with every win. We have to continue, especially in the month of November, to just incrementally improve, to fix our weaknesses, to accentuate our, our strengths, to build our program, to build our team, and continue to evolve and grow. And our record, in some ways, the results will take care of themselves if our process is impeccable, that it's the best it can be, that we don't cheat any days, that we all maximize our high support, film with individual players, film with our team, teaching, coaching, challenging, keeping the standard at a very high level, and then really back to all in, respecting every opponent that we play, respecting every game, because the second you lose that respect, You'll, you'll learn a hard lesson, and that is it's difficult to win in college basketball. So that's what we're about ready to embark on, and it's the beginning of a very long journey if you think about it. Our record is zero and zero. But I will end with this. I really like our group. We have experience. We have depth and physicality, and we have firepower. And, you know, I, I think that those are three things that we really want to keep as, as, a, as a program. Although the faces may change from one season to the next, our quest as a staff is to never lose those three things moving forward. And uh, I really love the attitude of our team. I think our identity is continuing to develop every day. And I know our team is very eager to begin playing games. Coach, best of luck this season. Thank yeah. you. It's been a long road to this point, but I, I think all of us are very excited you know, to, yeah. to finally see this team play it is uh it is halloween so favorite candy bar Whew, i have a bunch of them yeah <laughs> it's hard for me to pick one uh you know i like a uh, hundred thousand dollar bar oh. it's kind of an old school one yeah right okay um you know i i think that frozen milky ways are really underrated have you ever 
No, I haven't. But Try you just you give Try me it. an yeah, idea. It's kind here. of you got to watch you don't crack your teeth. <laughs> but there's there's something about a Milky Way when it's frozen. Uh, but I'm going to say my favorite, even though those are B and C, is is a Twix bar. Okay. Okay. I respect yeah. that. Yeah. I think that happened when I was about in second grade, and I, I've I've stayed with it ever since. A lot of candy that I can't do. Yeah. <laughs> Tough. Peanuts. All right. Peanuts go. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Okay. Yeah. Candy's not good for you, but those three bars are, I think I speak for a lot of people when I'm naming those three, especially <laughs> my age. <laughs> All right. Well, coach, we appreciate it again. This is, I know one of our longer episodes, but I think everything that we packed into here, um, hopefully one that everybody watching and listening enjoyed for Adam, for Josh, for coach, I'm Paul signing off. We want to thank each and every one of you for listening and watching through the off season. So much more content and everything coming to you here as the season gets going. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, Deer Park Roofing, and of course, our friends at Payroll Partners. This has been another episode of the Sean Miller Podcast. We have a, I'm not going to spoil it, but we have a very fun one coming next week as well that we've already recorded. So be on the lookout for that. This has been another episode of the Sean Miller Podcast. Thanks for listening, everybody. This has been the Sean Miller Podcast, presented by Deer Park Roofing, with your hosts, Paul Fritchner and Adam Baum. Join us again soon for another episode with the head coach of the Xavier Musketeers, Sean Miller.